enviable task, but it's a difficult task. How many of you have ever heard someone introduce with the following word, this man, this lady needs no introduction? That's the worst thing that can happen to us. But in this case, this person, this dear friend of mine, Dennis Haster, needs an introduction. Because you all need to know the things that this man has done to serve his God, his country, and his family. Folks, I appreciate you more than you know. You have blessed me in ways that I cannot thank you for by letting me serve with you. I can back up with you just a minute. Barack Obama lost North Carolina. Yeah. 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 My company did a great job. I enjoyed that speech tremendously. Look at that something. Folks, well, this is getting ready for a big game. My company was the inspirational speaker. He came in here and fired you up to win one for the giver. Now we get from inspiration to the perspiration. The perspiration is provided by our speaker tonight, the coach. Coach Denny Haster. Coached wrestling and football at Yorkville High School for 16 years, where he was a public school teacher. He served in the General Assembly in Illinois for three terms. He has worked to make this country better in ways that I cannot begin to describe. Let me give you some of this information because it is so amazing. Born in 1942 in Illinois, he graduated from Wheaton in 1964, degree in economics, got a master's degree in Northern Illinois, 16 years government and history teacher. He was coach of the year, won state championship in wrestling. He became national wrestling hall of fame member, Stillwater, Oklahoma. He was the 104th Congress chief deputy whip. The importance of that was his goal, and he was very successful, was to develop policy and achievable goals where people could work together, coalesce, and come together and do the right things for the country. There's a quote that I have here that tells you more about him and his attitude and what he believes in and why he's successful like Dan Forrest, and I want to give it to you. Solutions to problems cannot be found in a pool of bitterness. They can be found in an environment in which we trust one another's word, where we generate heat and passion, but where we recognize that each member is equally important to our overall mission of improving the life of American people. That is how he, as Speaker of the House, who, by the way, did not run for the office, you may remember in 1998 when I was elected, there were a few little confusing issues that took place. People running for office, speaker and others, had some issues, some problems. Well, as a new member, I joined with everybody else to pick the man with the servant's heart, with the coach's mindset, with the dedication to bringing us together and helping us achieve our goals and be the best possible members that we could be. His name was and is Dennis Haskell. Folks, that's remarkable. You think of all the people who worked so hard to get elected. He was there. He stepped up. And he was the longest serving Republican speaker in history. I went to Washington to raise money. Anybody here have to raise money? What you got to do? I went to this event and a nice fellow, very quiet. He was, in, he was there first. Dennis Haster. Got to know him day one. Last thing, I'm going to let him get up here because I've talked way too long. I went to Afghanistan at his direction when I was a freshman member. 
you all know about everything going on there. We went in his office after that trip, all the senior members, all the experts, they were giving all their opinions on everything. And it's all this went on around the table. I said, why? Wow. The coach said, Robert, what did you think? That to me personifies him, who he is, why he does what he does, and why he did what he did. And now he's got the grandchildren. He has started the Hastert Center at Wheaton College to teach young people in the course of service in a righteous nation, in a nation of laws. There's no one I admire, respect, and appreciate anymore than my coach, my friend, Denny Hastert. Please give him a moment. Great to be here in North Carolina and uh, to be with you folks. And I have to tell you, I, I was, had a little bit of apprehension this afternoon. I found out that they told me that I was going to be a kind of hit between California Pro and Mike Huckabee. <laughs> I wasn't sure how I'd be able to uh, one up that. But uh, I said they put me at the end of the program, so it's a little bit of a reprieve. You know, one time uh, I was speaker. Of course, I represent, represent the state of Illinois, and there was a president by the name of Bill Clinton who was the president uh, the first two years I was speaker. He was serving his last two years. He was giving a speech in Illinois, and I was summoned to be there, and being in part of the state was summoned. So I got on the, on the dais. I was in the school in the south side of Chicago, and I don't have to say much about the south side of Chicago, but it's really south. And, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the dais, it, it had 5,000 young people in, in this field house. I was standing there, and all of a sudden, the, <clears throat> I was supposed to give a speech, and Clint was going to give a speech before, kind of warm everybody up. And uh, then there was somebody else, and I wasn't sure who that other person was going to be. And uh, so I thought, well, look, at, in this thing, I'm going to keep it quiet. I'm going short. I'm going to speak about five minutes. And so Bill Clinton got up and he got the crowd going and revving and he could do it, you know, and people yelling and screaming and he spoke, you know, not five minutes, not 10, 15, about 25 minutes. And so I, I get up there and said, the best thing I can do, I'm going to talk about the, the, the positives of this program, what we're trying to do for these people. And I, I spoke probably five to seven minutes and while I was speaking, I put it on here to the left side and they're moving this big piano right up to my left side and thinking, what the world are they doing? I'm speaking, you're moving a piano. And uh, soon the, the flowers kind of get on the stage while I'm talking. And so I look back and there's this guy named Jesse Jackson, senior, who was walking on the stage as I'm walking up. And you know, he started talking and all of a sudden this guy on the piano started hitting the chords. And he talked faster and they hit the chords and got harder. And it got louder and he got louder and people were rock and roll and I look at I, I've been in the middle before, and so I appreciate being able to tell and talk to you folks and be at the end of this program. You know, I have to say, you've done a great job. Uh, you are the people that go out and work every day, you're the people that knock on doors, you're the people that raise the money, you're the people that make the party work. And uh, I've, uh, in my years as speaker, eight years, we, we figured out, we did a thousand campaign stops around this country. And it's people like you that make this party work. And uh, why? Because you are working people. You are the people that out, go out and have the small businesses. You're the folks that uh, go out and, and work on a family farm. You're the people who invest and make jobs happen. You're the people that punch a time clock in a lot of cases. But you put in an honest day's work. And you know what that work means. You take care of your family take care of your loved ones, and you help build this country. Now, not everybody has this attitude. I know that I, I could think back of the eight years in, in speakership, and what we tried to do in that eight years, even at the time of, of when Bill Clinton was president, we said that would happen. You did that by being able to control the budget. You have to have a House and a Senate to be able to do that. And in the first four years I was speaker, 
We paid down $650 billion of public debt. Because if you brought, if you brought money in and you put it in bigger programs, what the president at that time wanted to do, that money became part of bigger government. That became part of the system that you could never really cut back. But when you pay down debt, that means that you're, you're, you're doing your kids and grandkids a favor because they don't have to pay that, that down. And you know, that's one of the goals that we need to, 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 to focus on. And it's kind of a, one of those fiscal issues and one of those things that people really don't think about or talk about. Now, I'm an old econ teacher. I guess I can talk about it. Now, I said about economics. You know, I, I never fessed up to be an economist. I was just an economics teacher. And an economist, you know, I said, this is on this hand, and this is on the other hand, and I don't know what an economist would did. They only had one hand. But anyway, <laughs> that's the way it happens. But you know, I, I, I go back, and, and I, I was blessed, because I my time as speaker, I had some incredible people, and a lot of them from this state. Uh, back uh, at that time, uh, Richard Burke, was a member of the Congress, a young man, had great ideas, very uh, a lot of energy, wanted to move forward, do things. It was a great ally to have. Robin Hayes, one of my dear friends. One of the you know, in politics, you don't really have a lot of friends. But Robin, Robin Hayes was a dear friend, and uh, he's uh, shared a lot of his uh, ideas with me, and uh, we've been able to work together. Uh, we've also you know, had uh, Walter Jones and uh, uh, Howard Cole. What a great, great man Howard Cole has been. Patrick McHenry. And just recently I've been, uh, work, been able to work with George Holding and there's so many others. There's a, a cast of, of hundreds. And uh, you know, a, another good old friend of mine that, that we worked on, did a lot of work with, served on the Appropriations Committee, understood how you had to hold down spending to make the government work. Miss Charlie Taylor, um, good man. You know, those, those people that you sent from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., understand a couple things. They understand about family. They understand about hard, hard work. They understand about what they do leaves a legacy. And I, I guess that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight, is, is what kind of a legacy are we going to look at? And what are the, some of the things that we probably have to do? You know, I, I, I'm from, I might what you might call a Yankee now. Robin said I was never a Yankee, I was just a Midwesterner. But, um, you know, I, I don't quite as talk as fast as those guys from, from Arkansas. But anyway, um, I grew up, my, my dad was a Ralston Freedom dealer, so we were farm service people, and uh, I always say whatever happens, in the economy has an effect on politics. Whatever happens in the politics has an effect on the economy. Well, I learned that lesson when I was a kid, really quick, because we, uh, all our farmers were small farmers. They raised a little cattle, raised some hogs, raised a lot of corn. And all the corn that they raised, they went and fed those, those animals and livestock and shipped them to Chicago. They really sold protein, they didn't sell corn. And when the, when the uh, political decision was to make, to close down the, the stockyards in Chicago, uh, meant that uh, all of a sudden those farmers weren't growing meat anymore. They were growing corn, they were growing cash crops. And it affected our business because all of a sudden we didn't have a meat business. So we, uh, that economic consequence, that political decision, meant that you had a change. So for a kid that grew up in the back of a feed truck, all of a sudden I found myself frying chicken all the way through college. And uh, you know, you, so you change, you, you adapt. But my, I remember my first lessons on real work and um, we were small farmers, and I said we had just had a small farm. My dad was in the feed business. And um, I, uh, I always said I was kind of a country boy. I grew up in the cornfields in Illinois. And my dad taught me the whole lesson of economics when I was in third grade. Now, we had kind of side business. We had a thousand layers. And if you walk in, it's, you know, it's a, the previous speaker talked about not having snow. But, you know, in Illinois, we have 20 degrees below zero for two or three weeks at a time. And if anybody walked in a hen house with a thousand layers, when it's 20 below zero, 
He didn't. He could hold your, hold your breath only so long. But you walked in there every morning and every night. My job as a third grader was to gather the eggs. Because my mother had an egg route, had a thousand layers. You needed to get those eggs up twice a day. And you immediately had to stick your hand underneath that chicken. You knew that chicken was going to peck you. But you know, you also knew that that was part of the family livelihood. You knew that you had to do that. We also had a couple of cows. My mother had this egg route, and we also had butter. And um, not much, but some. And there's some customers that wanted that. And you know, I have my friends that come and uh, watch what we're doing sometimes, and they say, that's a, what is that thing? Oh, that's a butter churn. Well, how does it work? Well, you put the milk in there, and you turn this handle, and turn this cream, and, and all of a sudden, if you work long enough, it becomes butter. And everybody wanted to turn the handle probably 10 times, maybe 15 times, maybe 20 times, maybe they got the whipped cream level. But nobody, very, very few people ever wanted to stay there until you really got butter. But if you ever worked on a butter church, you knew that you just couldn't be there for five minutes or 10 minutes or 100 turns. You were there until it got done. And that real work is hard, it takes time, it takes dedication, and uh, in the end, you get the reward. But yeah, you know, I, I think politics is the same way. I, I, there's, I always say there's four P's in politics that I think are pretty important. First of all, if anybody wants to be a, pol a politician, you need to have a passion. A passion means that, you know, that there's there. But, but you can't have a passion without having a purpose. Why do you want to be a politician? You want your name in the headlines? Do you want, uh, you know, to make some money? Don't do that. Do you want to, you know, to, to have all this uh, this adoration? Not a lot there, there. But if you want to make things better, if that's your purpose, then you have to have a passion to do it. Because it takes hard work, and it takes that fire in the belly. Uh, some of you being able to look across this room, some of you folks who really have, have done that, because you've all run for office. And anybody that has run for office in this room, knows that you have to have a fire in your belly. You know that you have to work hard. You know that you're going to take uh, criticism. You know that you're going to have to have a you know, thick skin on your back because people are going to you know, say some unkind things to you because that's part of the purpose anymore. There's two sides in, 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 in politics, and that's to build up trust, and that's to have people to know you and talk to them and get to know you and what you believe in. But there's other guys on the other side of the aisle that are going to try to tear down this whole negative campaign, and they're going to try to rip all that trust away. But that's the tough part of being a politician. So, you know, you, you have to be able to have that, that purpose, but you also have to have that passion, because the passion is the only thing that gets you through. And then, you know, you have to have persistence. Because most of the things that you want to do, you can't do in a couple of weeks, you can't do it in a couple of months. Now, I found you could do things in the legislature, in the Illinois State Legislature, quicker than you could do in the Congress. But some of the big things that you wanted to do, it took years to do that. Years and years and years. And a couple of big pieces of legislation I got an earnings test and, and uh, the uh, uh, medical savings accounts that I thought were so important. It took us sometimes nine or 20, 12 years to get those things done. And then, you know, one of the things that you have to teach yourself and have to teach your kids, that you have to have patience. That just takes time. It takes time hard work. And you can't throw your hands up and then walk away. You have to stick with it. It might take months, it might take years, it might take decades. But to make real things happen, to make real change happen, it takes a long time. And you know, that's some things that sometimes today's politicians don't want to do that. They want instant change. They want instant gratification. And I have to tell you, working with your folks in North Carolina, along with a lot of other good folks across this country, we were able to say, here's some values. We want a smaller government. We want the government to spend less money. We wanted to make sure that our young men and women who served in our armed services had the wherewithal and the training and the equipment that they needed to do the job that we asked them to do. We also worked to make sure that when they came back home, they had the services and the help that they needed to have. And we get headlines when bad things happen. But it takes hard work and it takes persistence. 
and your folks that you sent to Washington worked hard to make that happen. You know, also, I think, uh, I think of the, of the battles that I had, even before I became speaker, uh, Robbins that I was chief deputy with, the chief, job of chief deputy with, when you bring the contract for America to the floor, you have to make sure that you have the 218 or 220 votes. And day in and day out, you, pock, you, 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 you buttonhole people, you got their answers not once or twice, but three times before you counted on that as, as you could count on that person. And you did it day in and day out. You got to know their wives' names and their kids' names, because when you call them at night and you got the kid to answer the phone, he'll tell you whether his dad's home or not. <laughs> Those are the times you, you knew where they hit out. You knew where there are places they like to go you know, after votes sometimes. You also knew where they hit out in the cloakroom. Because you had to know everything about that person, but when you learned about that person, the, the whole substance, the glue that holds politics together is trust. Trust between a constituency, and the people they elect, trust between leaders, trust between members, trust between a committee chairman and, and the people that sit in his committee. And any time that a politician loses that trust, or a parent loses that trust, or a businessman loses that trust, he's pretty much out of business. And trust is also awful, awful hard to get. It's awful easy to lose. So most of those people that you send to Washington, or you know, send them to the state capitol, are people that have earned that trust and are willing to spend a lot of time and hard work to keep that trust, to make North Carolina and the United States of America a better place to be. Now, one of the jobs I had, and it just, you know, I've had a lot of jobs in my life and none of them I've really applied for. Uh, I, I got out of college, I ended up, you know, I was going to coach, they asked me to go to at Wheaton to come back and, and coach freshman football the year I, after I graduated, and did. Well, it also led to a teaching degree, and uh, <clears throat> five years of, of coaching was stretched into 16 years. I never planned to do that. I was an economics major. I was going to go make money. And then all of a sudden, I was a chair, a president of a coaches association and a national coaches group, and uh, somebody asked me to run for the legislature. And he said, you know, you, you've done all this stuff on, on the athletics, uh, the, the politics of athletics, you, you can do this. And I did it. You know, people laughed at you, the wrestling coach going to the legislature, that's fine. You, you heard them laugh then, you should have heard them when I ran for the Congress six years later. But you know, it just kind of happened. And uh, one of those, those, op those openings happen, and you just make that decision whether you're going to go or you're not going to go. And I've always been blessed because my wife, uh, God bless her, has been always there, and supportive. Uh, you know, I leave for Washington, and uh, she was teaching school, taught in the same little school for 34 years. Uh, I would leave on a Tuesday morning, and I know that she would take those kids to school, she would take care of the problems at home, uh, and, and kids would be happy to see me when I came back on Thursday night, or Friday morning, whatever I got back from Washington. She kept our home together, and, and you know, there's not many politicians that can be very operative and have a family if they can't really depend on their spouse. So I look at all the spouses who stand behind their, their husbands or, or men that stand behind their wives that serve our nation and our state. And it's very important because they are just as important sometimes as the candidate themselves. But you know, I, I had a deal. I had a deal with a spouse. It was uh, 1993. Uh, and I was doing health care, and somehow, again, I just got kind of pushed into this job. Got, so I kind of let, let Denny do it, you know. I, I would go ahead and do it, and not complain, and do the work. And so I was doing health care, and, and the, the first George Bush was running, and he was known as, a, as really a, a great internationalist. I mean, he would have been in Desert Storm, and he had worked with the NATO, and NATO and got all the European nations in line, and did all these great things. But all of a sudden, the economy started to filter the at the end of 92. And uh, this guy from <coughs> Arkansas, he said, well, it's the economy, stupid. And they're talking about jobs and wallets. And then their guy named H. Ross Perot uh, came off to even to the right and uh, drew, drew pictures and graphs on the TV. And all of a sudden, we had these people called Perot's. And uh, we thought we were going to win. Well, you know, 
We did. And uh, the pro took about 19 votes off of our, 19% off of the Republican tally. And this guy from Arkansas became president of the United States. And his, health, his wife was going to fix the health care system. So our leader, the Illinois House, a guy named Bob Michael, great, great patriot, great uh, veteran of World War II. Matter of fact, one of the men that when he was 18 years old made the DNA invasion. But uh, Bob asked me to be the point man for the Republican House on Mrs. Clinton's health care task force. But you know, I have to tell you folks, I've never gotten invited to the White House. I don't know why. I wasn't part of the program. But I had to meet with this guy named Ira Magazine a week in and week out. And so we basically put together a plan um, medical savings accounts, uh, uh, free market uh, transparency and costs and, uh, and health care, people that, that make choices because we felt the most important thing between <coughs> a good health issue was this trust between a doctor and the patient, and that's what we ought to feel, and that's how we ought to focus our whole health care plan. Well, all of a sudden, I started talking to this magazine guy, he's talking about gatekeepers and committees and didn't say death squads, but that's what they were. And you know, I, I really kind of got really upset. And so they were supposed to have a bill out, it was supposed to be in March, and then the bill didn't happen, it was supposed to be in April, and it didn't happen, it was supposed to be in July, it didn't happen. And finally, we were asked to go to this dinner with Mrs. Clinton and a guy named Jennings, who was her health care staffer. And so it was a little house that was supposed to be clandestine, although when we got there, the press was there. Wasn't very clandestine. So it was about 10 of us Republicans, and we sat around this table, and Mrs. Clinton was there, and uh, she talked about the whole dinner, talked about her health care plans, and at the end of the dinner, we each asked, got to ask some questions. And so we went around the table, and it was mostly folks from the budget committee. I was just kind of added on to the, to the agenda. And so everybody asked questions about budget and costs, and, and finally I said, uh, Mrs. Clinton got to me. I was the last person. I said, I want to ask you a question. I talked to Zyra Magaziner about health savings accounts, medical savings accounts, where people really can, can decide how they're going to spend their own money. She said, yeah, I know. I've talked to Ira Magazine about medical savings accounts, but we just can't do them. I said, well, that's interesting. Why not? She said, well, you know, there's two reasons. Said, okay, well, what are they? She said, well, first of all, in a medical savings account, you know, people have this savings account, and if you don't spend it, you get to keep it. Tax-free, I said, yes. And she said, well, you know, we can't trust the American people because people are basically greedy. So it works. That you know, a husband won't take their wife, his wife to get the checkups she needs, and won't take their kids to get inoculations, and they just won't do and, and spend this money the way it should be spent. So what do you think of that? We said, well, the government will tell people when to do it. We will have this regiment that uh, will lock people into this health care system. <coughs> I said, well, that's interesting. I don't agree with you, but you said there's two reasons. I said, what, are, what is the other reason? She said, well, you know, the other reason is basically that uh, all that money in medical health and medical savings accounts goes into the private sector. I said, well, yes, it does. She said, well, you know, we know that the federal government will spend that money better than the private sector will. So, yeah, I just said, raise my eye. And uh, the next day, I went to see Bob Michael. And I said, Mr. Leader, I, I just had a meeting last night with uh, Hillary Clinton, talked about health care. And you know, we've been trying to work with these folks. And uh, basically, we're trying to work on policy. But we're not talking about policy. We don't agree with the policies. We're, they're talking about philosophy. They're talking about a philosophy where government knows better how to spend people's money than they know how to spend their own money. That, how, that they know better than how people put their money, their hand in their pocketbook and have to pay the, the, the bills day in and day out. The government can spend those people's money better than they can do it for themselves. And they also believe that the government can make better decisions for you and the folks that, that work hard and their families than they can make for themselves. And you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of groups of students and uh, I lecture uh, pro bono a lot around this country. And kids, college kids and high school kids ask me, what's the difference between a Republican and a Democrat? And you know, I have to look and think, you know, here are these kids, they really don't know. But when you really can really make the difference between our party 
and that other party is that believe, we believe that, that individuals have the inherent intelligence and God-given right to make decisions for themselves and not to give those decisions over to some big government. <laughs> Individuals, when you work hard for your money, when you have a job, when you sweat and earn that money by the sweat of your brow or the wheels that go off of your head, however you earn that money, that you spend that money better than some government bureaucrat in Washington. So, you have a great story to tell. And we have a great challenge. You know, we talked about previous speaker talk about all the terrible things that happened in Washington. I kind of work in Washington a couple of weeks a month. I know what's going on there. Uh, matter of fact, he's from my home state. Uh, we're not proud of that, most of us, but anyway, it's there. And, uh, you know, we have a chance to change things. Now, we change them one step at a time. We have a House of Representatives. You have all of your House members that are up for office, and probably most of those folks don't have a very tight race, but there's some new, right, new open seats that they're going to have a tough race. And you folks that have that in your district, you've got to work real hard to make sure they get reelected. As a matter of fact, we have a chance in North Carolina to replace a Democrat seat with a Republican. We need to make that a number one priority. You know, then there's the other house. Of course, if you're a Republican leader, a Republican, somebody's been in the house for a long, long time. We always said the Democrats were the adversary and the Senate was the enemy. But anyway, we have to win the Senate. And you have, you know, again, you win that Senate, just one vote here or one vote there. You've seen that happen in this state. That we need, there's, there's six opportunities, or maybe seven opportunities. We need to change every one of those seats. And you do it by working, working your precincts, getting your kids to vote, getting your neighbors to vote, getting your church folks to vote, to vote people that you know and talk to every day. And that's turn the vote out this November. And so to start out by keeping the, keeping the House, building the House, and then taking that Senate. You take the Senate and the House, you control the purses of, 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 of the government. And you can really determine what some of the things happen. Now, this president will go outside of the law. So that gives you a reason that we even need to work harder in two years. And I don't know who that candidate's going to be. And I don't know what his platform or her platform is. But I know the things that will make this party work. And that's the, 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 the beliefs of our, found, our founding fathers. The beliefs that you know we, need, we have a free enterprise system. And we need to build that free enterprise system, not regulate it to death. We also know that we believe in individual rights and God-given rights. And we need to hold on to those rights and build those rights and not give them away to the to bureaucrats that run Washington, D.C., whether it's our education system, our health care system, or the way we work, or the way we drive our cars, or whatever else we do. Those are our, our, our opportunities. And, you know, this is a country of opportunity, but unless you take advantage of those opportunities, you don't win. I'm an old coach, and I can tell you that you don't win the state championship starting three weeks before the tournament. You build that championship years and years ahead of time. You find the right people, you train them in up in the right ways, and you work at them, and you condition them, and you work them, and you work them, and that's how you win. And politics is kind of the same way, you know. Rob will remember we had a young lady, not so young lady from, from, from New Jersey. That was one of those Yankee states up there. Anyway, someday, one day she tried to stop me right in the middle of our conference, which we every Wednesday morning, we got all the Republicans together and we'd have a line of people up at the mic and they'd all tell me what they thought of me. Some days it was good, some days it wasn't so very good. But anyway, this woman would get up every day and she'd speak her mind. And finally one day she says, you know, I'm getting so tired and sick and tired of you using sports analogies in this politics all the time. And I said, young lady, I am what I am. And we all are what we are. And we need to take our best assets and what we are and make things work. And so all you folks who have different talents, 
and from different parts of the state, we have one goal. We have one goal to keep the, 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 the U.S. Congress together. We have one goal to make sure that you put a new person, this time, tell us, into the U.S. Senate. Yeah. And make that thing stronger. And then, that is the, the prelude of changing things in 2016. And it's time for change. Change comes from grassroots up. It doesn't come from the top down. And all this hope and change that they talk about, it didn't happen because it came from the top down. We can change from the grassroots up. You're the folks that have to do it. Uh, listen, I, I was really honored to be asked to come and talk to you today. You know, I'm not running for president and I don't speak real fast. But I try to hope to put you some Midwest, just plain old logic and common sense together. You're great people, you're a great state. God bless you, thank you.